not be able to do the work that we are able to do out in the community without their help and support. And I specifically would like to recognize uh, Connect Kids to Parks and Parks and Trails New York grant programs. So I do have some learning objectives for us this evening. Um, I will introduce you all to the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society or AMCs as we like to refer to ourselves because it's a pretty long name. I'll be going over the differences between aquatic and marine invasive species. The specific invasive species that are found in New York, how they're introduced and what impact they're having, and then of course, how you can help. So first, what is AMCs? So AMCs is an organization that was essentially founded by a group of volunteers who were looking to make a difference. Um, the organization was founded in 2016. So we're just coming up on our five year anniversary. And as an organization, we are permitted to respond to live and stranded marine mammals and sea turtles. So hearing that you might be wondering, what is a stranding? So a stranding is when an animal washes up on our shore and it is sick, injured, or deceased. Um, and so when these animals are actually deceased, we perform necropsies or um, it's an autopsy, but on an animal. And we also refer to these necropsies as mortality investigations. So we are analyzing this animal and kind of getting an inside look at how it lived its life. So we'll be able to tell, um, was there any food in the stomach? Did it have a last meal? What was its normal diet um, consisting of? Did it eat anything abnormal? Um, if it's a female, we'll be able to tell if she gave birth recently. Um, we'll be able to tell if she's lactating. And we'll also be able to tell how many children she gave birth to uh, based on evidence in her reproductive uh, organs. We'll also be able to tell, did this animal come in contact with humans at all during its lifetime? Um, and that can be from marine debris ingestion or an entanglement or a fishing interaction or a vessel strike. Um, so there's a variety of ways that these animals end up interacting with humans in our waterways. Um, we'll also uh, perform uh, health assessments on our wild populations of our seals and even our sea turtles. So when we're doing these wild population assessments, we will actually go out and capture seals. And in doing that, we basically collect um, biological samples from them, from their eyes, their nose, their ears, even their mouth. Uh, we'll take blood samples. We will get their weight and get a total length. So it's a lot of information that the doctor would get from you when you um, go and see your doctor for your annual physical. So it's kind of like that. And we will also attach a flipper tag to the seal on its hind flippers. Um, and we'll even attach a satellite tag on top of the animal, as you can kind of see in this photo um, right here. There's a satellite tag right there on the seal. And that gives us um, a great insight into how the animal is utilizing their marine environment, which is really important for our local stakeholders and um, decision makers for what's happening out in our waterways. And we also host education and outreach events like this one that we are doing here with you all this evening. Um, it's something that we really enjoy getting to engage and interact with our community members because you guys are a very important part of what we do um, through promoting marine conservation through action. So as I mentioned earlier, we are permitted to respond to stranded marine mammals and sea turtles all over Long Island and the coast of New York. Um, and we'll even help out some of our partners up in New England um, if they need us. So. We have a very small staff of eight people. So to cover all of that coastline, we cannot do it without the public's help and support. So if you look in this top right photo, these are two of our biologists, one being Jen right here, um, performing a necropsy on a stranded loggerhead sea turtle. So they're measuring the carapace or the shell of the turtle in this photo. And we have two of our great volunteers here with two of our biologists. Um, so our volunteers are a huge asset to our organization. 
We'll actually train them uh, to help us respond to strandings and help us with necropsies. Um, currently, a lot of our volunteers have been helping us on a daily basis with the sea turtles that are in our critical care facility that have been with us since December. Um, and they were a part of the large uh, group of Kemp's Ridley sea turtles that were cold stunned uh, up in Massachusetts um, in the late fall of 2020. And um, our volunteers help us with that, but then they also help us at education, outreach events, beach cleanups. Um, so we are very thankful for all of their help and support. We also have internships available. Um, so this is one of our interns, uh, Gabrielle. Um, she's actually a previous intern, but came back to volunteer, which we love. And so here she is measuring the carapace of one of our cold stun Kemp's Ridley patients. And as we respond to marine mammals and sea turtles, most of them um, are endangered species or at least um, threatened. Um, and that's all based on the Endangered Species Act. And then our marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so we work very closely with our local, state, and federal um, agencies and law enforcement to sometimes help us control the scene um, if an animal strands in a very um, populated area, which that does happen. But then also these animals can strand in places that aren't very easy to access. And that's where these partnerships really come in handy because a lot of these uh, municipalities and local law enforcement agencies have access to these areas that the general public doesn't. Uh, so we really appreciate their help and support in responding to stranded marine mammals, especially in areas that we can't necessarily get to um, as quickly as we would like. And then of course, last but certainly not least, uh, members of the general public. So having you guys join us on our um, beach cleanups and beach walks, or if you help us monitor the beaches for cold stun sea turtles, all of that really helps us achieve our mission of promoting marine conservation through action. So first, what are invasive species? So uh, this word has been used to describe non-native uh, plants and animals that have been introduced into a new ecosystem. And a lot of people call them alien or exotic or even a nuisance because they certainly can be. So the federal definition of invasive species is a species that is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So just hearing this, does anybody have a certain animal that comes to mind when they hear of an invasive species? You guys can feel free to put your answers in the chat and Jen will read them out loud. Um, someone said wolf. A wolf? Maybe to some areas, yeah. Um, lionfish slash Asian carp. Okay, good. Um, a stink bug is another answer. <laughs> Yep, it's down here, <laughs> the stink bugs. If you ever find one of those, don't smush them. You'll understand why they get their name. <laughs> um, I haven't seen any other answers yet, but um, we actually did get a question right as you were asking your question. So I'm not okay. sure if you'd like to answer that now. Um, so the question says, why did the turtles get cold stunned in Massachusetts? Did they not leave in time? Great question. So yes, um, this is something that happens about the same time every single year. So when that first cold snap happens um, up in the New England area, a lot of the turtles that are up there during the summer and early fall, they're not quite ready for it. They haven't anticipated that that cold weather is coming. So they haven't been able to move south um, because our turtle population does move down to like the Carolinas, Florida, and even farther into the Caribbean uh, during our winter months. 
because if you guys uh, didn't know, um, sea turtles are reptiles and as reptiles, they are ectothermic. So they utilize their environment to regulate their body temperature. So when that water temperature drops really fast um, and it only has to get down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the turtles basically go into shock. And when they do that, they're no longer swimming. They're no longer eating. They're basically hanging out at the surface, just trying to survive. So they're utilizing all of their energy and their food storage to try and just make it through um, that period of time. But unfortunately, throughout that time, the wind can easily push them up onto the beach. And once they're out of the water, time is of the essence with those animals because one, they're marine animals. So they're not used to having their body weight on their organs um, because they're used to gravity kind of helping them out in the ocean. Um, and then also the you know lack of water, lack of food, the wind is definitely going to kind of spiral their health even quicker. Um, so it is something that happens regularly that time of year up in the New England area um, and the New England Aquarium and other partners up there are always very prepared, uh, but especially this year, COVID definitely proved challenging um, with you know, staffing and having people there to take care of the animals. And also this year, I think it was the second largest ever cold stunning event in that area. And so the New England Aquarium and their other partners were just overwhelmed. So we were asked by NOAA Fisheries if we would be willing to um, kind of spin up a sea turtle triage facility and take in turtles. And we were happy to do that. And we were able to take 20 sea turtles. And actually our last ones are being flown down to Georgia tomorrow to be released. So very exciting day for us tomorrow and those turtles. So hopefully that answered um, the question. So moving on to aquatic versus marine, and I know both of those words sound like water. So what is the difference? Um, so aquatic invasive species are non-native plants, animals, and other organis organisms that have evolved to live primarily in water. Um, so aquatic habitats, rather than on land, so terrestrial. And not all introduced species survive in a new habitat, uh, but those that thrive are given the term invasive. So it's basically animals that were terrestrial, then made their home in the water and survived, but they are still considered, you know, not a native species to the water. Um, so zebra mussels are a great example of um, an aquatic invasive species. And then our marine invasive species are live marine plants and animals, including their seeds, their eggs, um, their spores or other you know, biological structures um, that cause harm when intentionally or unintentionally introduced into a marine um, estuary or brackish ecosystem uh, where they're not native. So that can be whether they're introduced into the ocean and estuary or um, like a river and a stream and that kind of brackish water. Um, so if you guys are not familiar, the Long Island Sound is actually an estuary. So it is a mix of freshwater and saltwater, which is a very important ecosystem for a lot of our juvenile species. Um, so when these marine invasive species come in and are basically taking over the ecosystem, it has a huge impact on our really young um, juvenile marine species. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So now we're gonna focus on the invasive species that have been found in New York. And our first one is going to be devil's tongue weed. So I'm sure you guys have seen this out there. It's one of the largest known uh, red algae species that can be found. It's actually native to the Northwest Pacific. And it was first reported in Rhode Island in 1996. And it's typically found in a wide range of coastal habitats. Um, and this species can survive in both warm and cold um, temperate regions. So up here is perfect for that species. 
Um, they can thrive in native or artificial habitats, and they can grow on a variety of substrates, including rocks and cobbles and boulders and shells and even ship hulls. So very easy to get around um, and spread to other areas. And it was believed to be introduced uh, by ballast water or hull fouling. And we're gonna, gonna get into the spe specifics of those a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but this invasive species um, outcompetes the native algae up here in our um, you know, New York and New England area. And it really alters the benthic or the bottom community of these marine habitats. Um, so also the sightings of devil's tongue weed on the East Coast um, definitely include the Long Island Sound. So this um, species of algae is found in our waters and um, it suggests that you know, supporting fewer biological organisms compared to the red algae. So it's kind of taking over, but it's not really bringing any positives to the Long Island Sound ecosystem. Our next one is called dead man's fingers or green fleece. I'm not exactly sure who came up with these names, but they were very creative. And this dark green algae is native to coastal Japan and was first introduced in New York in 1957 and continues to disturb our coastal ecosystems along the East Coast and you know, all around North America. And this algae will attach to a variety of substrates or surfaces and can impact many of our bottom dwelling environments um, by basically prohibiting the movement of our animals that live down there. And it actually smothers our shellfish, po shellfish populations, um, which is not good for the economy or the uh, marine ecosystem and the natural food chain. So moving on to the siphoned featherweed. So this is a very fast red algae, um, fast growing red algae that is native to Asia and was first seen in South Old New York in 2009. So it hasn't been around for too long compared to those other species that we just went through. Um, but this aggressive invasive species clones itself asexually. So it doesn't need a partner um, to make more of it. And it thrives in nitrogen rich waters, um, ultimately outcompeting our native species for nutrients. Um, so if you guys have been paying attention to the Long Island Sound, over the years um, and with those large fish die-offs, a lot of that is because of something called hypoxia. And it's when nitrogen levels in the water are so increased and the oxygen levels are so decreased that our fish aren't able to breathe and they actually die. And that's why a lot of them are washing up dead um, this winter. And I'm sure you can find it in other times throughout the year as well. Um, so this siphon featherweed actually kind of thrives in that environment. So it's just another reason that we need to be paying attention to um, the health of our Long Island Sound. Um, but as it dies, the siphon featherweed will deplete oxygen levels in the environment. And when it dries out, it gives off this terrible like rotting egg smell. Um, you can't really avoid it. So um, basically the Long Island Sound is a great environment for this type of invasive species to thrive because it just provides um, kind of the perfect concoction for it. So moving on to our sea squirts. So these guys are soft bodied marine invertebrates. So that means they do not have a spine uh, and they grow on hard surfaces and feed by filtering really small particles such as phytoplankton and bacteria uh, from the water column. And these invasive sea squirts can easily outcompete our native species. Uh, infestations can certainly alter our Long Island Sound, you know, the natural food web. Um, but these guys do, when they're filtering that water, they do help to clean it. So it's kind of a positive and a negative. They're out competing our natural sea squirts, but they are filtering the water. So the exact impacts of the sea squirts on the native Long Island Sound organisms, um, it's really unknown. 
because the C squirts have been in the sound long enough, like decades. Um, so it's really unclear how they originally affected the native communities. Um, or because you know they might infest deeper parts of the sound where fewer people go and those areas aren't necessarily being um, studied. So still looking for more information on them, uh, but they are a native um, an invasive and not native species. Now we're moving on to our European green crab. So if you guys spend any time out near the water, I'm sure you have seen these guys out there. Uh, they're a very common crustacean uh, to find in New York. Um, and they're also known as like a shore crab or um, a Joe rocker, some people call them. Um, but it is native to Europe, uh, as it comes from the name. And it is believed to have been brought to North America through ballast water, hole fouling, or all, maybe even intentional release. So people intentionally release these animals. It's most frequently found in sheltered, intertidal, and shallow uh, subtidal habitats, usually like near the low tide line, and on mud, sand, or pebbles. And the green crab can tolerate a wide range of salinities, so that's how salty the water is, and can be found in estuaries and um, water with extremely low salinities as well, so almost um, fresh water. And a little fun fact, we actually um, fed some of these crabs to our uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtles um, because as they are, you know, an invasive species, they really have taken over um, the Long Island Sound and the surrounding waterways. This is something that our Kemp's Ridley sea turtles would naturally feed on out in the environment. And it off also offered them an opportunity for um, enrichment and kind of was teaching them ways to be hunting food and with live food um, out in the water. And they are listed as one of the 100 worst invasive species. So that was another reason we really had no problem with feeding them to our turtles because um, they were actually brought to us by a volunteer and uh, they're an invasive species. So they need to become a part of the food web um, and they need to have predators out there. And Lindsay, we actually had a question asking if they're edible like local crabs. They're pretty small. So I don't think you would want to eat them. Like, um, I don't know what's a good, maybe like three quarters put together is kind of the size that they are. So they're not very big. So there's really not enough meat for um, human consumption, but they're great for our little turtles. So moving on to our Chinese mitten crab. So I'm sure you can tell from this photo how it got its name uh, with those nice furry claws and pinchers. Uh, so they originated from Eastern Asia and the Chinese mitten crab is a well-known invasive species in our New York waters. And this crab is obviously easily recognized out there by their uh, white tipped claws covered in hair, basically. Um, and the, this crab is thought to have been transported to the United States through ballast water or even through live trade. Um, so basically it was brought over, sold, and uh, somehow made its way into our waters. They can be found in both freshwater and um, our salty marine environments because they actually breed in brackish to marine waters. And then they move into freshwater environments as juveniles to mature. And um, they actually burrow into the sediment and create holes that are about three centimeters in diameter and um, can be easily identified on the sides of like some river banks. Um, and they're a very big problem for many reasons. One being that they feed on both plants and animals and will consume whatever is readily available. So they are not picky eaters. And they'll actively compete with our native species such as the blue crabs and other economically important crustacean species. Uh, for food and shelter. So this doesn't only 
So this invasive crab doesn't only disturb our ecosystem, but it could also impact the local economy if they continue to outcompete the native species of crabs, such as our blue crabs. Now we have our Asian shore crab. So these crabs are indigenous to the rocky shores of the Western Pacific Ocean and was first recorded in the United States in 1988. And because this species can tolerate a wide range of environmental conditions, it has expanded its range and is now abundant along the Atlantic uh, intertidal communities uh, and coastline from Maine all the way down to North Carolina. And though they don't really understand how the Asian shore cap was introduced, uh, many speculate that the larva or adults were introduced through ballast water. And they're typically found within natural and artificial intertidal uh, rocky habitats, but they've also been found in salt marshes and um, subtidal habitats. And the Asian shore crab has caused major ecological change on the rocky and intertidal communities along the east coast of North America. That includes Long Island. Um, they reproduce rapidly. And the recent trends are showing the populations of these shore crabs increasing while our native crab populations are decreasing. And it's because it predates and competes with several of our native species and could be directly impacting the populations of several other important species in New York, including the blue crab, the rock crab, and even our lobster. So definitely uh, something that we wouldn't mind removing if possible. So now we're gonna get into the ways that they are introduced. So you probably heard me say this term a lot when we were talking about the different species. So ballast water is used to stabilize vessels during voyages by taking in water in one region and discharging it in another which basically gives a free ride to these invasive species. Um, it allows these animals to travel hundreds of miles in a very short period of time in the hull of a ship. Um, and most ships are required to use a water treatment system to remove or kill any organisms in their ballast, which has slowed the rate of species transport, but it is difficult to ensure the effectiveness of these very expensive systems. And it's also, you know, you have to have people out there regulating if ships are actually following this rule, which can prove to be a whole different challenge. So a majority of goods are transported by shipping and uh, which creates many opportunities for introduction of our non-native species to basically slip pass in our safeguards and into our environment. So does anybody have any questions about um, how ballast water works and um, how these species are introduced through this way? I haven't seen any questions in the chat so far. Cool. So now we're getting into whole fouling. Um, so Basically, some organisms, not all of them, but some organisms can attach themselves to the bottom or the hull of vessels and travel essentially wherever that vessel goes. Um, and this is called hull fouling or bio fouling. And marine organisms um, will attach to commercial and recreational vessels, as well as basically any fishing gear that they can use to attach themselves. Um, and this pathway doesn't only transport the invasive species, but it can also diminish the performance of the vessel, reduce the vessel speed, um, and requires time and money to eliminate uh, the unwanted organisms and clean off um, your hull and gear that they might have uh, come over on. So the live seafood and aquarium release. Uh, so the live seafood uh, basically refers to any fish, um, invertebrates and algae that's imported regularly into the United States 
um, whether it's sold as food or for the aquarium trade. Um, so organisms are transported in tanks of water or on ice, uh, which after use can be uh, discarded into nearby bodies of water and um, accidentally releasing viable biological structures of these non-native species. So as they are sitting in the water or um, sitting on the ice, um, you know, they could uh, release their um, young and things like that. And then that can be released out into the water once people discard the water they came in or the ice. Um, so those are things to think about. Uh, there are also incidents when invasive species are released intentionally. Uh, so there are individuals who believe that they are saving um, an aquarium or food species um, by releasing them into the local waters. But this can actually lead to the demise of the animal released. So it might not be suitable for that environment or have extremely negative consequences on that environment, ecosystem, and food chain. Um, so I always encourage people, you know, if you don't support the aquarium trade, that's fine, but we don't need to go, you know, busting those tanks and letting all those animals go because it could definitely have an extremely negative impact on your local ecosystem. And these animals are a global problem. It's not just, you know, here in New York um, and Long Island, it's everywhere. So you'll actually see the United States has a significant number of uh, invasive species. Um, so over here, if you're kind of looking at the scale, um, it goes from no data all the way up to red, which um, lots of data, lots of species. So the this is the number of species. So in the United States, we have somewhere between 200 and 523 uh, invasive species that are either inhabiting um, terrestrial or marine environments. Um, you know, we have Canada and Mexico and some of the um, some, uh, these areas down here that have species as well. Um, we've got Australia that has a lot. So it's definitely a global problem. It's not just a United States problem. It's all over because as we know with our marine environment, it's very easy for these organisms to move and they can move through the water column and our um, currents and our streams. Uh, so it's definitely very easy for them to um, kind of maximize their space in a way. So getting into our lionfish. Um, so if you guys haven't heard of this species, um, they are um, a real nuisance in a lot of the uh, Caribbean, Central, South America, um, especially our Southeastern United States. Um, they're all over the place. Um, and so some characteristics are not just the lionfish, but on invasive species are that they mature very early and they reproduce um, rapidly. So the lionfish in particular uh, matures at a very young age and actually lays up to, I wanna say like a hundred eggs um, every few days. So they're just constantly reproducing um, which is obviously a struggle when you're trying to remove them from the environment and they just um, keep repopulating. They have few to no predators. Um, so once these invasive species um, are, you know, introduced in the environment, some of those apex predators and those organisms that you think would eat these animals aren't because they've never seen them. They don't know what they are. They don't know if, you know, it's poisonous um, and actually lionfish are venomous, their top spines. Um, so, you know, it's hard for most organisms to eat them without being inflicted with some kind of injury. Um, so a lot of our invasive species really don't, they just don't have many predators once they're introduced into a new environment. They also have a very broad diet. So they'll eat pretty much anything that they can find. Um, and with lionfish in particular, that's a really big problem because they are preying on the natural fish species that are really important for um, 
you know, some of those local uh, economies. So the lionfish eat, um, specifically down in Florida, I can speak to that. They eat a lot of the snapper and grouper, and that's fish that a lot of the locals will recreationally fish for, for, you know, their meals, but also some of the local restaurants and even the grocery stores. Um, so these fish are, the lionfish are definitely having an impact on the populations of um, some of these very commonly seen uh, fish, fish species down there. And they can tolerate varying environmental conditions. So these guys were um, thought to be brought over from the Indo-Pacific um, and you would think that they wouldn't really be able to thrive in, um, you know, temperate or very tropical waters, uh, but they do. Um, and they can adjust very quickly to these different um, water temperatures, different depths. Uh, so it's very hard to combat the problem when they don't really seem to have any problem, uh, you know, hanging out in the new environment. And our native species may have no defense against their predation because they kind of don't see what's coming in a way. Um, you know, these species are introduced, they um, reproduce rapidly. So then there's many of them, they're not being eaten. And these native species that they're then being preyed on, they have no idea kind of what they're up against. Uh, so it's definitely a losing battle. And they outcompete the native species for food and shelter. So these guys kind of come in and just take over really. Um, and the native species are being preyed on. They have less food. They don't have good shelter. Um, so, you know, these invasive species are definitely having a detrimental impact on not just the local economy, but the local food chain and are the native species that are found in these areas. So getting into what are their impacts? So ultimately an invasive species can reduce native populations and habitats, which leads to a less diverse ecosystem. You know, and the whole thing about a good and healthy ecosystem is seeing diversity. Um, and so this, these ecosystems are then more susceptible to further disturbances such as diseases and natural disasters. And so this photo is actually um, a map of invasive algae um, at the Pearl and Hermes Atoll, um, which is a reef system in Hawaii. And the algae is basically smothering all of the native algae and corals, um, which if you guys know anything about cor corals, um, they are an uh, animals, but they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. And so they need sunlight in order to um, grow and thrive and be healthy. And this algae is just absolutely smothering it. There's no way for it to receive any sunlight. Uh, so it's very detrimental and will eventually lead to the death of the uh, algae, the native algae and the coral species. Um, so it's definitely having a negative impact on tourism and fisheries. Um, which is very important to Hawaii's um, local region. So um, another way that they uh, alter the um, local habitat and ecosystem is through the economy and our recreational activities. Um, they can clog waterways, they can interfere with recreational activities like boating and swimming, and um, some marine invasive species will attach to substrates, as I mentioned earlier. So the hull of your boat, um, maybe your anchor or um, your engine and propeller, um, maybe your fishing gear. And so this kind of reduces the efficiency of that very expensive equipment. And the impacts of these invasive species can be very costly. Uh, and kind of eradicating them or restoring the habitat can be expensive as well. Um, so although most of the impacts um, caused by um, invasive species are to the environment and the economy, in some cases, human health can be impacted as well. Uh, some of these invasive species can be carriers of diseases that could potentially be transmitted to humans, and some invasive organisms can be poisonous to humans if encountered 
And we might not necessarily know that if it's the first time we're seeing this species, we don't know that it can harm us. So now getting into how can you help? So first, uh, don't release any animal, plant, or seed into the wild. Uh, this includes reptiles, insects, aquarium plants, fish, and mammals. Um, many of our aquatic pets and plants are not native to our area and should not be released into the environment. So, um, you know, lionfish are a good example, but also um, down in Florida in the Everglades, they have a huge python problem. Pythons are not native to the Everglades. They were released in the aquarium trade and these snakes become huge and prey on the local um, small mammals like um, squirrels and things like that. And so it's really depleting those population numbers and becoming a huge problem uh, to have these snakes out there in the wild because they're just taking over. And they actually, um, pay people to go out and wrangle these pythons and kill them in the Everglades, um, which is just absolutely wild to me to think about, uh, but it's you know a way that they're trying to combat the problem. So be smart about your bait. So don't move your bait or other fish from one body of water to another and don't release any unused bait or worms. Uh, always use native or non-invasive plants for your gardens and landscapes and ponds. And you can always ask the local plant nursery um, for plants that are native to our area. They are very knowledgeable about that. So do not disturb. So disturbance of habitat often allows for invasive plants to take hold. So we suggest minimizing the impacts of development on your property by building your driveways and decks and things like that, um, only as large as you really need them to be. And by using uh, previous building materials, which will actually allow water to filter through them and um, kind of prevent an opportunity for any um, invasive species to quickly move in. Uh, excess um, nutrients can allow our invasive uh, plants to thrive. So maintaining our septic systems and cesspools is really important. Um, utilizing slow release fertilizer has been thought to help as well. Um, so things that you can do at home if you have a garden, you know, making sure that you are using slow release fertilizer if you choose to use fertilizer, um, planting um, native plants or certainly non-invasive species um, are two great steps and making sure that your um, septic tank is you know, working properly and um, we're not having any leaks or anything like that because as I mentioned earlier, with our Long Island Sound ecosystem, when we have excess nitrogen out there, it not only lowers the oxygen in that environment, but it kind of has a gateway to letting our invasive species thrive. Uh, so we certainly do not want that. And Lindsay, we just had a question um, asking, what does slow release fertilizer do? So it's basically um, a greener way to go about um, getting some organic matter into your soil, which is better for your plants because they certainly need that in their, um, you know, as they're trying to grow when you're planting them. Um, and it's a uh, kind of extended over time. So as some fertilizers, as soon as you put them down, they start working immediately. But also if it then rains um, within the next day or so after you're putting that fertilizer down, basically you're losing all of the nutrients that you were hoping to get down into your um, soil. And it's basically just running off into your storm drains, um, which for Long Island basically all lead out to, um, you know, one of our bays or the Long Island Sound and eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. So that slow release kind of helps you um, over time releasing those um, uh, nutrients and um, organic matter. Great. Um, and we had one other question that says, um, pump or aerate the septic tank? 
personally, I am not very knowledgeable about septic tanks. It's, I think you, you probably need to talk to more of a professional. <laughs> um, I know that they're supposed to be serviced quite frequently. Um, you know, a lot of people I've heard don't really service them, you know, more than once every 10 years, but I think they're really supposed to be serviced, um, you know, at least every three years, if not more frequently than that, um, by a professional, um, servicing, um, you know, business. So, um, if you haven't had your septic tank serviced in, you know, at least a couple years, that might be something to think about. Um, and you really just want to make sure it's also not going to be backing up into your home, um, that's something I don't know. I always get a little stressed out about. Um, you definitely don't want that coming, you know, back up. So uh, I suggest if you haven't had it checked out, maybe that's something to put on your uh, spring to-do list. And uh, clean, drain, and dry your boat. Uh, so taking proper care of our marine vessels is extremely important. Um, when we are trying to prevent these aquatic and marine invasive species from entering our local ecosystems. Um, so thoroughly cleaning the boat, and that includes everything. So the trailer, the wheels, um, your prop, you know, the anchor, your bait bucket, basically anything you put in the water, you want to make sure that you clean it off really well when you get back. And that also then kind of allows you to um, use all these materials longer. Um, so kind of, you know, uh, expands their lifespan, if you will. And we certainly don't want any um, introduction of more invasive species into any of our marine environments. And also report your sightings. So if you guys didn't know, um, there's a lot of literature, um, especially in New York regarding our invasive species. Um, and it's very helpful information. So the there's something called the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. And that's their website right there. Uh, so you're, if you're at all interested, I encourage you to check it out. Um, they have lots of helpful information on there. Um, and they really encourage people to use at least one of these three methods to identify and report invasive species. One being um, this app that is called IMAP Invasives. And it is um, a database and it can be accessed as a website or um, on, a, on your phone as a mobile app. And it allows you to upload a sighting report for any invasive species that you might come across. And that includes um, a mapped location of where you found it. So uh, mapping this data collected on the app will actually help scientists identify areas that they might need to target to then remove the invasive species. So, um, but the only catch with IMAP invasives is that you have to know the type of invasive species that you're reporting. So you have to be able to already identify it, um, which can be a little tricky if it's something you haven't ever seen before. There's also um, an app and a database called iNaturalist. Um, and it's an alternative reporting option for those who um, you know, may be less confident in your um, identification of these invasive species, um, but you still want to help. So by using this app, you can actually upload photos of the plant or animal that you were not able to identify. And um, someone on there will be able to ID it, ID it and will be able to tell if it's, if it's an invasive species or not. And then of course, um, the third method is that you can send an email to um, with the date, time, location, and photos of the species that you saw that you think is invasive. Um, you can send that to um, the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area or um, the New York DEC. So we like to end most of our presentations by um, telling you guys that we encourage you to share our beaches and that comes with a lot of different things. But the first one is keeping our beaches clean by taking your trash with you and any other trash that you might find along your journey. Um, I will say 
that's something that, you know, I find really interesting is that if trash, um, cause as we know, our marine debris moves through the marine environment. Um, if it starts in one place, and perhaps an organism is able to attach to that marine debris and basically cruise through our current and um, the water systems and land somewhere else. That's another way that invasive species could be introduced. Um, so I encourage you to try to collect um, any marine debris that you find or join us for a beach cleanup in the future. Um, also, be sure to stay um, 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle in the water or on the beaches. Um, so that doesn't have too much to do with our invasive species, but as an organization, that's um, a point that we always like to make is that, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these species that we work with are protected either under the Endangered Species Act and or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So we need to respect them, give them their space, and by law, you have to stay 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle, whether in the water or on the beach. And report any marine mammal and sea turtle sightings to sightings at amcs.org. Um, if you guys are out there um, enjoying the marine environment and you see any whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, sea turtles, we certainly would like to know about that. Um, so if you could, um, you know, send us an email um, or you can visit our sightings page on our website and report when you see one of these great animals out in our environment. And of course, please report any sick, injured, or dead marine mammals and sea turtles to the New York State Stranding Hotline. Jen will put this phone number in the chat, but it is 631-369-9829. And I encourage you all to just go ahead and put that in your phone if you have it nearby. Um, our boss uh, always likes to say, you know, he's responded to over 5,000 animals in his career and never once has he been the one to call that animal in or find it first. It's typically always a member of the public. Um, so you guys are a critical part in our mission of responding to stranded marine mammals and sea turtles and um, promoting marine conservation through action. And with that, does anybody have any questions that we weren't able to get to during the presentation? Um, so Lindsay, we did just have a question come in that said, do you think there is any saving the beaches with all the pollution that there is? I think so. Um, also my mentality is you have to go into it with a positive outlook. Uh, I don't think there would be many people in the marine science field if uh, we didn't have people thinking positively um, about what we could do to make that environment better and um, kind of help clean up what humans are doing. Um, I feel like a lot of us take um, kind of a personal responsibility when it comes to that. Uh, so I certainly think, um, you know, you might not be able to do it alone. It's a global problem and we need people everywhere to step up and, you know, make a difference in their personal choices um, in order to really combat the larger problem. But, um, you know, I'm always happy to get out there and uh, do a beach cleanup and do my part. Um, and we actually host beach cleanups every Saturday um, at Halleck State Park Preserve in Riverhead um, from 10 to 11.30 usually. Um, so if you ever are feeling inclined to come join, join us, um, we'll be glad to have you. And we're working on hosting beach cleanups in other locations as well um, across Long Island. But I think we all need to work together to uh, make a difference. So, um, and a good place to start is removing marine debris. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come through. Okay. Well, I know I kind of threw a lot of information at you guys. So if you think of any questions later, please feel free to email me at education at amcs.org. It's right here on the screen. And I'd be happy to answer any of your questions or if you're looking to get more involved with our organization, we'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. 
Um, so sorry, we actually just had one come through. Okay. Um, it says, are there any invasive species um, that have not had their species discovered, like an unknown species? Oh, I'm sure. Um, especially some of those that, you know, are hidden and are probably in areas that aren't necessarily being studied as frequently as others. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure we have not discovered all of them, uh, which is a somewhat frightening thought, knowing that they can have such a detrimental impact on um, our native species and ecosystem. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. I think that was it. Awesome. Well, it is eight o'clock now. So I just want to say thank you all for joining and spending an hour of your time with us this evening. I would also like to thank the Port Jeff Library and Barbara. Thank who's you. On here. Thank Excellent. You. Always. Thank you. Always a great presentation. Happy everybody joined us tonight. We'll yes. see you next time, Lindsay. Sounds good. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, folks.